So, good morning everyone and welcome to the second day of the uh, presentations at the SAQ conference. You'll notice in front of you on the desks there is a, uh, a couple of uh, volumes of Australia Water Management Review. The uh, Stormwater Industry Association uh, contributes to that magazine twice a year. It's a, available as a hard copy and as well as an um, online copy. Uh, it's probably produced, I don't know how many, hundreds or thousands of articles across it. Uh, a whole range of issues, all, all aspects of um, engineering and uh, even outside of engineering to more broader project management and environmental services. And um, uh, one of the articles that SIA provided to it has uh, been recorded as the second most read article in its 10 year history. So uh, this is one of the many ways that you know, we can add value to uh, members of the SIA because we um, we uh, get the message about stormwater out there to a broad range of professionals. Um, I'd like to thank and congratulate other members of the uh, conference subcommittee on their great work, uh, particularly Nicole Romillo and Brian McIntosh, uh, and, and the GEMS event management team, particularly Debbie Hudnall and Peter Freeman, on their great work in putting this conference together. There's a lot of work involved in putting together a conference and one of the biggest challenges we often find and uh, room for debate and discussion is choosing a keynote speaker. Uh, there's a lot of options to consider. So it's an interesting exercise because it forces you to think seriously about what directions the industry is taking and who we will look to for leadership and inspiration on the main challenges and issues. So I'd like to share with you an experience I had about 18 months ago when we were organising the previous conference for the 2011 conference and we were considering who we would select for keynote speaker roles and um, many names were put forward and um, can start that One person we considered at the time was the uh, Chief Climate Commissioner, Tim Flannery. You may recall that back in 2005, Mr Flannery had warned that Australia, uh, due to climate change, drought conditions along uh, eastern Australia could be permanent and that the ground surfaces would become so dry that even if any rain did fall, it wouldn't fill our dams. Uh, Tim has also frequently and recently described climate change issues in the context of the uh, Gaia Principle and what is the Gaia Principle? James Lovelock developed the Gaia theory back in the 1960s while working with NASA. It claims that all of the organic and inorganic components of Earth are closely integrated to form a single and self-regulating system. This living system has automatically controlled global temperature, atmospheric con content, oxygen, ocean salinity and other factors. So in summary, it posits life maintains conditions suitable for its own survival. And this is a picture of, um, in 2003, Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth II awarding James Lovelock a companion of honour for his achievement in science. The influence that this concept has had on generations of scientists and policy makers cannot be overstated. He's quoted as saying, before this century is over, billions of us will die and the few breeding pairs of people that survive will be in the Arctic where the climate remains tolerable. That was in 2006. In 2007, Time, Management, Time Magazine named Lovelock as one of its 13 leaders and visionaries in an article on Heroes of the Environment, which also included Gore, Mikhail Gorbachev and Robert Redford. Uh, a quote from that article, Jim Lovelock has no university, no research institute, no students. His almost unparalleled influence in environmental science is based instead on a particular way of seeing things. And that was Oliver Morton of the journal Nature, as he wrote in Time magazine. His ideas about Gaia have started a change in the conception of biology that may serve as a vital complement to the revolution that brought us the structures of DNA and proteins in the genetic code. So back to my story, in 2009 while we were identifying keynote speakers, 
Simultaneously, the dams were starting to fill once again. The permanent drought was coming to an end, it seemed. In fact, just a month ago, on the 27th of April, Agriculture Minister Joe Ludwig stated that the two final areas in Australia receiving federal exceptional circumstances drought support, located in New South Wales, would cease being eligible this month. So at the time, I thought it may be appropriate to hear views from someone who may have a slightly different perspective on climate change issues, one whose predictions were a little more circumspect, that is, not as extreme as those put forward by Tim Clannery and James Lovelock. The name I put forward was Emeritus Professor Garth Paltridge. His views on man's impact on natural climate changes are somewhat controversial because they don't fall into line with the consensus view as advocated by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. After a very brief email chat with the rest of the committee, I decided that it may not be a good idea to create any controversy, so I parked that idea and moved on to other speakers. However, just two months ago, a surprising announcement was made by James Lovelock. On the 23rd of April this year, James stated that he has gone back on his previous claims, admitting that they were alarmist. He said climate change is still happening, just not as quickly as he once warned. He added that other environmental commentators, such as former Vice President Al Gore and Tim Flannery, are also guilty of exaggerating their arguments. In the interview with MSNBC.com, he said, I made a mistake, we extrapolated too far, he said, the problem is we don't know what the climate is doing. We thought we knew 20 years ago. This led to some alarmist books, mine included, because it looked clear cut, but it hasn't happened. The climate is doing its usual tricks. There's nothing much really happening yet. We were supposed to be halfway toward a frying world. Back in 2010, James Lovelock admitted that he had respect for the views of some called skeptic scientists or what he half-jokingly calls, calls the baddies. Um, what, who did he pick as the sceptic scientist he has most respect for? None other than Australia's own Emeritus Professor Garth Paltridge. In March 2010, James Lovelock said, there is one sceptic that everyone should read, and that is Garth Paltridge. So who is Garth Paltridge? In 1968, he was a research scientist at the CSIRO Division of Meteorological Physics, eventually renamed the Division of Marine and Atmospheric Research, and was promoted over the following 11 years to reach the level of Chief Research Scientist. In 1990, he became Professor and Director of the Institute of Antarctic and Southern Ocean Studies at the University of Tasmania between 1990 and 2002. James went on to say that he's written a book called The Climate Copa, it is a devastating, critical book. It is so good. This impresses me a lot. The book provides an insight into how climate change science has evolved and how consensus is defined. Climate science is described in terms of its relationship to funding, the media, education and politics. The contrast between the claims in this book regarding uncertainties in the theories and what we are constantly being told through other channels is quite unsettling. He says, there are many aspects of climate that are inherently unpredictable. I will leave it to you to confirm that both Garth and James emphasise the uncertainties around the science. There are many messages to take away from all this, and these are elaborated in the Professor's book. Firstly, the very concept of a consensus in the climate change science is a nebulous one. Secondly, we need to be careful about what we consider to be true. How should we question what we know? Regardless of our opinions of James Lovelock, there is no doubt that he was a leader. Changing his mind on one of his life's most defining messages reminds us that it is feasible to be a great leader and to change one's mind when the facts change. Margaret Thatcher, another great leader, had a similar change of mind on this issue. Perhaps tomorrow's leaders are here in this room. I hope that this conference will not just inform them but inspire them too. You are the people who will continue to bear the responsibility for water management for future generations, so I urge you to continue to consider new sources of information on this topic, and remember what is controversial today may be revisited tomorrow with fresh eyes. Remember a scientist called Galileo had to face similar challenges to his authority, to authority. It may be your effort that opens up the insight and inspiration to others, that drives them to action to identify real solutions to real problems in the future of environmental and water management in Australia. 
I'd now like to, uh, that's the end of my talk really, I'm going to introduce the speakers now. I'll now introduce Jeremy Brown of Stormwater 360, who are the gold sponsor for the conference. Could you please all welcome Jeremy?